Oh, that word lecture always strikes. The only people who talk about me lecturing is my children, you know, and, and they don't appreciate it. The outstanding lecturer is not, that, that adjective is not what they use when they talk about it. So hopefully, uh, hopefully this will, you all will feel better at the end as we get through with this. I'm really excited about doing this. This is, a, this is not just something that interests me academically. This is something that interests me very personally. And, and so the things that I'm sharing today are things that I'm continuing to think through. It, it, these, are, these are not finished thoughts. These, these are thoughts that are still in process, and I'm learning from my students. I'm learning from the research that we're doing, uh, and I'm learning from people like yourself. As a matter of fact, I look around the room, and I think of, of the seeds and, uh, that have been planted in me uh, by many of you. And I am so excited uh, to maybe... Hopefully at the end of this, you'll, you'll think that maybe there's been good growth from what you've invested in me along the way. And so I'm very grateful, very grateful to, to be able to do this. Um, as we get into this today, I want to invite you um, to, to raise your hand and ask questions, to participate. Um, I, I'd like to get to a place at the end which will be more experiential because uh, as we get into this topic, I want to start with the with where we're going to end. I want to tell you my conclusion before we ever get, get there. Uh, some of you all may be leaving early, so if that was the case, you know where we're going to be heading. But where I'd like to, uh, to end today is that, practically speaking, I want to talk about communion and contemplation being the things that, that are really about, uh, are the, the things I want you to take away from this time. That these are the two things that are foundational in not only forming us, but also foundational in making us good for others. Maybe, let me take that a little bit further. It, it's, it's important, the communion and contemplation as disciplines are important because unless we're doing those, we may not be safe for others. And so let's, let's get into this and let's unpack this a little bit, but that's where we're going to end. The roads that I'd like to see us try to merge today come from three directions. Uh, the first is, as Ron has mentioned, Trinitarian theology. I remember some of my first contemplations, my first consideration of this topic. That actually happened within an FAS gathering. Uh, I was invited, I still don't know why I was invited at that time, to, to, to uh, sit in on a discussion very early on in the process when Dr. Kinlaw was developing the, the book that became Let's Start with Jesus. And, and I remember being of being just fascinated with this theological stance that I have, that's been a part of my, uh, my growth and development as a believer, but not formally. And so to be introduced to, uh, to the names of people that have become some guides for me in this process, process Colin Gutton and Tom Torrance, um, uh, out of the Catholic tradition, uh, Casper, and some of these other people that are that have been very foundational for me, discovering Stanley Grins along the way and, and some, other, some other, uh, other ones that we could name and you all and have been good for you all as well. But uh, I remember getting launched into that time after that meeting. And since then, these other roads that have come into my experience, getting, very, getting fascinated with the neuroscience end of things because after being introduced to the Trinitarian view of, a, of our world, of our universe, it's funny how the neurosciences, I began to go, well, that sounds a whole lot, that sounds almost theological as we're getting into this and as we're discovering the way we're made neurologically. And then to jump into uh, what's called attachment theory and the idea that we are not just, relationships are not just something that we have, relationships are foundational for who we are. That it, we just don't have, we're kind of embedded in a relationship. And that embedding quality is something that actually affects us, not, affects us in a way developmentally. We are who we have been related to in many ways. And so as we talk about a relationship with Christ, it makes a whole lot more sense, doesn't it? You know, the formational process. But we'll, again, we'll talk, I'm getting ahead of myself. These three roads are the ones we're trying to merge today as we think about it. We're just going to introduce it. There are a lot, there's depths that we cannot plumb in this in this amount of time, but hopefully there's enough introduction that we can, uh, I can give you some other ways to go, other ways to think about it. Let me start with a question. 
question I, I love asking because it's kind of a fun question for me. I, I still remember asking it in some classes and getting some interesting responses to this. But what do you imagine it was like before creation? You know, you ask those budding theologians over at the seminary this question, and they just wax really, really poetic at this point. I mean, it's just, it's just kind of fun. What about for you? What about for you? What, do you? what was it like before creation? What do you think? Oh, you're going to be quiet today. <laughs> All right. What was it like? Scripture didn't tell us a whole lot about that, really. I remember asking in one class, the, uh, uh, the first response I got from these budding theologians was boring. <laughs> really profound one was dark. You know, I was wanting them to think a little bit more deeply than that. Thelma? Right, right. Uh, the creation that we know. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Yes. Yes. It's fascinating where science is going with all of this. It's fun to follow it theologically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I love as as those seminarians begin to come around to think about the thing that we can be sure of. The thing that we can be sure of is. Uh, what we had was Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in divine communion with one another. You know, and the, uh, the, one of the things that I, I love about this was listening to one person said, uh, he said, what I, what I imagine it was like was a lot of laughter. And I said, tell me more. Tell me more about what you're thinking about because I think that's a really cool response. Tell me what, what's going on inside. He said, well, when I think about the relationship within the Trinity. When I think about the, the, the relational dynamics, this perfect sort of communion, perfectly making space from what perfect receiving, perfect giving, you know, this, this sort of perfect holy love that exists. He said, I can't think of anything better than there just must have been a lot of laughter and enjoyment of one another in that process. And I, I thought that that was a really cool response. Now, theologically, there are some of you sitting out there that are thinking, that's way too shallow. And that may be, but it, it, apply, it appeals to me. It appeals to me. Yes? I think, I think that's exactly what that laughter aspect that this, this student was affirming. Yes, very much so. I mean, you think about even in our very finite way, a very limited way, thinking about the, what we're like when we're in that relationship where there's that, that closeness and that intimacy and that sense of safety and security and, and there is that, that uh, just enjoyment of living there. It's kind of like, can't we stay here forever? Can't we, can't we live in this, this kind of condition? Doesn't it maybe speak to what we're made to live in? It's, it's just a very profound place, that harmony with no disharmony. Can you imagine it? Can you imagine it? No clocks or calendars. No clocks or calendars. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely true. <laughs> well, <laughs> just imagining, just imagine. I love, I love Rublev's Trinity and this depiction of, uh, of the Trinity. It comes out of uh, the visitors that, uh, and looking at Father and Son and Holy Spirit being the kind of the amplification of, of, of that story. Um, but I think, again, it speaks to this idea of what, uh, of what we find within the inner, the indwelled nature of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This sense of, of perfect loving communion. That we, want to, that we want to see affirmed and we want to begin to build this worldview out of. This is something that not only he is, 
but it may say something about who we are to be as well. And maybe some hints at that as we look at some of these other areas. I love the, uh, one of the comments I remember Dr. Kinlaw making it and, and ended up being in print was, you know, the idea that terms like king, judge, and sovereign speak of what God does, of his rela relationship to his creation. But that's not really who he is before, you know, as we thought, talk about the beginning. That's just not who he is. The best description of who he is is this idea of loving communion. That we were, again, I, I hope you're hearing that. I'm sure you are. I keep on repeating myself, but I, I want that to be very strongly a part of our foundational discussion here. This loving communion that is God. And this loving communion that is God kind of trickles down into creation. You know, the, the stamp of who he is kind of moves into the created order. Let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. That something about this likeness, although you can talk theologically about this from a lot of different angles, but something about it is relational. Something about it is relational. We are made in his image, and this relationality is something that he didn't just create in us. It's just kind of patterned after him. And when we begin to think about this process, when we begin to think about what this is for, I love this quote from Tom Torrance. And I, 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 before we read it together, I, I just want to, uh, to say to you, be very careful. The warning here, like on the cigarette package, you know, you got the little Surgeon General's warning. The warning here is this may lead to worship. So be very careful as you read this. Because here we have the living God who reveals himself to us in such a way that he creates in us the capacity to receive and apprehend him. And he communicates himself to us in such a way that he lifts us up into the inner communion of his divine being so that we are given to share in the mutual knowing of Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and thus to know God as he is himself in the imminent relations of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Creation is for this purpose for us to share in this indwelled loving communion between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And everything is to support this process of, of lifting us up to share in that experience with Him. If God is best described as loving communion, then we have to suggest that maybe our purpose has something to do with loving communion as well. And that as we participate in that, God has the ability to, to lift us into himself and we find what we are to be. We find who we are within those contexts. You know, you get to the end of a quote like this and it's like a do, the doxology or something just needs to be sung. You know, it's just, you, you look at that and it's like, yes, yes. There's something in me that resonates that this is what I'm made for. There, there's something in me that says, yes, that's what, I, that's what I'd like. That feels right to me. And it is right because we're made for Him. We're made for Him. We're made to experience in Him in the same way, to participate in this, to share in it. But I'm just telling you things you already know, right? As we begin to, to think about then, how does this Trinitarian understanding of who we are begin to be seen in some of these other areas? I want to begin to merge these roads if I can. You know, we are created for Him. We're created for loving communion. We're created for, to, to live within that indwelling process of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But we catch snippets of this. It's almost like God in his wonderful, his wonderful love for us has given us these clues seeded into not only the world, but seeded into who we are, things that reflect this Trinitarian reality. And so let me see if we can't think about this a little bit. Daniel Stern 
says that one of the things, he's a psychologist, developmental psychologist, does quite a, quite a bit of writing these days, but looks at, uh, looks at infants and their development. He says it this way, one of those clues, not a believer. He says, our nervous systems are constructed to be captured by the nervous systems of others so that we can experience others as if from within their skin as well as from within our own. A sort of direct feeling route into the other person is, part, is potentially open, and we resonate with and participate in their experience, and they in ours. What do you think about that? This nice secular psychologist, developmental researcher, hardcore when it comes to empirical studies, makes this kind of statement about who we are in our construction. What do you think about that? What, 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 what do you reflect on? Where does it take you, Ron? Absolutely. It, the entering in to the experience of others. And that, that that process is not only something we can do, it's something that we do. It's not like you can shut this off. You are doing it. Now, some people are more conscious of it. I'm sorry. Don't go ahead. Absolutely. Absolutely. The language is very important. The, I want to also come back around, though, that there's, there's something that we find neurologically that stands alongside language that cannot be, cannot be dismissed, and yet there is a, a nonverbal, emotional process that goes hand in hand. As a matter of fact, neurologically what we're finding is you can't separate these anymore. You used to think, okay, we can talk about people cognitively and we can talk about people affectively, you can't do it neurologically anymore. You can't have one without the other. And so, yes, absolutely. The primacy of language along with the primacy of, of the emotional, the affective resonance that goes on between us, we want to affirm both of these as we're doing. Thelma? Absolutely, absolutely, very well said. And the research supports that very process, that, this rela that our relationality is actually being carried out in the womb prior to birth. You know, it used to be, truly, back up to about 15 years ago, there were people that would tell you that children came out in this sort of autistic stage, that they weren't relationally connected until some certain things would happen. And now we realize, now we realize that that's completely false that children are relational even in the womb. Absolutely. There's an other. There's an other in the picture. Yes. And there's an otherness indwelled. There's an indwelled otherness. And again, what an iconic sort of picture for us that God's given us in this. What a wonderful, at least metaphor, that we find for what we're talking about today. Thank you, Dylan. Yes. And I'm thinking of uh, just the opposite when these relationships aren't there. I'm thinking about orphans, for example, who are wounded in ways that you can't necessarily always document. Yes. This yes. points to that as well. Very much. It very much points to that. The other side is exactly. We not only benefit from relationships, we're going to talk in just a second, that we, we have to have relationships. And it shows up 
not just in social impairments, but structural, anatomical impairments, if that's not there and present. We'll talk more about this, this side of it. Thank you. Yes. No, and I, I think that, again, there's there's physiological support for what you're saying in the sense that that there is an um, there is a communication that occurs pre-verbally with us. What goes on between, for example, a a mother and a child is not it's not language based in the be, in those in those beginning years, the first 18 months of life in particular. That that what goes on is pre-verbal, and yet there is a communication. You know that is happening. That's at a more emotional, affective, bod embodied level. So it is. It is. But to enter into their experience on anything less close to or than empathy, there's got to be that capacity to communicate. No doubt. I think that's the thing. It's, it, what we're looking for is where we have that balance between the two. The, the emotional, the implicit sort of process that goes on along with the, along with the more reasoned, word-based, language-based process. I see even language is emotional. I, I don't oh, it is. Well, that's what I mean. I'm, well said. Well said. Well said. I think that's one of the things there that we have to realize. Again, these are wedded together, and to talk about them separate from one another is an abstraction that doesn't fit with the with our physical reality or our relational reality. But we sometimes break them apart to, to try to engage them. But that is an abstraction. That's, that's exactly it. it. It's very possible. Very possible. You know, I love, I, one of the things that, let's just make this very practical. You know, when you walk up to the, the person at the grocery line today who's checking out your groceries, you're sharing an experience. You are communicating. You are involved in their lives and they in yours in a way that you may not be conscious of, but you're sharing information that changes one another in a profound way. We'll talk more about this, but this is what I mean when I said before, if, if we're not being formed in the way that we are meant to be, we could be very dangerous without ever knowing it to the people that were around. Now, we'll get more into that. We'll get into more into that. But, oh, let me, let me come back here. I, I think what this speaks to, I, I love the idea of abiding that we find in John. I wonder if, again, some of this speaks to a deeper way of looking at abiding than we often think about. There is a deep physiological, emotional abiding that we have to begin to think about as well as illustrated by this, this sort of thing. You know, th this idea, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may, all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may, 
that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one, just as we are one. I and them, you and me, and they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. This oneness. Now, here's, here's the hard thought in this. We often talk about the choice to be one, and there is something about that. But there does seem to be, to some degree, a sense that we are becoming one anytime we interact with the person, a person in a relationship. There is a oneness that's happening physiologically and emotionally and relationally even with a person I'm interacting at a very superficial level. We talk about oneness as imaged in marriage, and that's exactly right. And yet there is a oneness that oftentimes we don't even think about that occurs across the belt with the man or the woman who's checking out my groceries. And if I'm not a steward of that situation, I do not, I am not able to reflect the amazing reality that's going on in that moment. And I not only live in denial of something that could be very holy, that is very holy, actually. Mm -hmm. Yes. Absolutely, absolutely. That's, that's one of those goals that we miss when we, when we miss this, this sort of abiding process that is always invitational. From, it's always happening, not just invitational. It's always it's happening. There's that movement toward this, this process that we are just oblivious to oftentimes. It's also scary. It's also scary. You know, as we think, it, the, the beauty of it and yet the profound nature of it is also a little intimidating. It also, you know, talk about the unequally yoked issues, you know, that, 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 that the image in Scripture. The reason why we have, one of, the, one of the reasons why we come together in communion as a church and the necessity of that for moving off into relationships that are not safe or to have relationships within the church that are not safe as well. I mean, you, you begin to think about how this plays out. Let's think some more about it. Fred? Um, when, when I was in high school, my grandfather came to live with us after my mom died. Mm -hmm. My dad died. And I was noticing that when I was alive, And the other side of that, that it's, it's imaged in him. I mean, it's, you know, that, that's the, we're made by him for that sort of process. We work best. It's part of, as E. Stanley Jones would say, it's part of the way. And as we live in it and function within it, there's harmony. There is a harmony. As we live against it, we break ourselves. We die. Yeah. I love this from a group of physicians, again, not believers, Pardon the long passage here, but I hope that as we read through it, it will make sense and it will bear with me. Because human physiology is an open loop arrangement. An individual does not direct all of his or her own functions. A second person transmits regulatory information that can alter hormone levels, cardiovascular functions, sleep rhythms, immune functions, and more inside the body of the first. We're not talking, certainly we know that that happens in intimate relationships. 
you know, husbands and wives begin to look like each other. You know, we, we see that sort of process. I'm always worried about, uh, I was reminded by a, an older gentleman that sometimes we look like our dogs, and that scares me to death. <laughs> but that's, uh, if we have two, so I try not to get too intimate with our animals. But the, uh, but the, <laughs> but the reality is, is that here is this process that we're involved in every day. When you are in interaction with strangers all the way up to your most intimate connections in life, you are trading information, emotional, physiological, spiritual sorts of transactions are going on that we're not even aware of. The reciprocal process occurs simultaneously. The first person regulates the physiology of the second, even as he or she is being regulated. So here's the other thing you can't, you can't say. Well, I am kind of the expert in relationships, and as we engage together, I will help you be better. Because I'm always on top of these things, relationally. I'm the expert in this. Can't do that. Because as I, as I am transmitting and regulating them, they're doing the same to me. We are changing one another in the process. And in that dynamic process, it calls for great humility. Talking with pastors about pastoral care, what does that look like if you are... If you go against the older models that just say, you as pastor are the effector of other people. What does it mean when you are the affected? As a matter of fact, what does it mean if you're both and you can't necessarily always trust your reactions in the process to be holy and well-meaning for the other person? What does, that make, what does, what does pastoral care look like? in those situations when I am affected by the person that I'm with and I'm affecting them too. It's one of the things we're wrestling with as we engage this, this topic. This last part though. Absolutely. And I, let, me, let me take that a little bit further. Each of us is, is participating when we, as we participate in it with each other. It's a highway, again, as we lift one another, as we participate in the lifting into that inner working of the Trinity. So oftentimes, we don't, we don't come individually. God doesn't lift us individually. He tends to lift us together. How do we, how do we make space for that relationally? What, what does each relationship look like if, it, if we're always affirming the potential for us together at whatever level of the relationship we, ha we have, that we, are, we have the potential of accepting an invitation into that indwelled, holy communion of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? It's a kind of an amazing thought. As we think about this, neither is a functioning whole on his or her own. Each has loops, open loops, that only somebody else can complete. Together, they create a stable, properly balanced pair of organisms. We, we're easily affirming this in marriage. It's going on all the time. You're doing it to each other right now. <laughs> Mark, Martin just said, sorry. <laughs> I think I have to say that a lot in my life. <laughs> But, it, but again, it's this process we're not even aware of. We're not intentionally. And if we're not being formed in the image of Christ, the impact we have on other people may not be what we hope. May not be what we hope. Absolutely, absolutely. 
you know, this idea of perichoresis. Now, is it possible, is it possible then, that some of what we're finding in the neurosciences points to this sort of indwelled nature that is God? Is it possible that some of the things that are being talked about as mutual regulation between me and the person that I'm in a relationship with, whether that's stranger or Carol, my wife, is what's being talked about something that reflects God? Has it been seeded into who we are to point back to him? Or this idea of attunement, attunement with one another. You know, is it possible that these are iconic sorts of processes that not only tell us something about who we are, but also point back to who God is? I think Trinitarian theology would suggest yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit more about attunement, but I want to I give you an opportunity to hear someone who's doing some research in this area and let him explain. What are, what is, let's talk a little bit more about attunement and mutual regulation. We're going to talk about a form of reciprocal connectedness called attunement, and this is what it looks like. Uh -oh. Okay, this mother need a little bit more volume. and this baby Chase. are in a, in, a, in a process called attunement. His eyes and her it is, eyes it is going, but I don't have any sound coming. Are locked together, not locked together, but dancing together, really. Okay. Let me go back here just a second. We're going to talk about a form of reciprocal connectedness called yes. attunement, yes, and this is what it looks like. Okay. This mother and this baby are in a in a in a process called attunement. His eyes and her eyes are locked together, not locked together, but dancing together, really. And in this child's brain, a thousand connections per second are being formed. And this child is learning to read facial expression. This child is learning about the world. He's learning that the world is responsive or not responsive. He's learning that he can be an object of delight, that he can delight others. He's learning what he's worth. He's learning what the world is like. He's learning so much so quickly that we can't even conceive of it. This interaction is critical for human development. Without it, you, you, you're impaired in so many ways. I can't even begin to speak of them. Some of them you see in your courtroom. And so what happens is impulse. The mother, and the mother, by the way, is being changed as well. Oxytocin is being secreted. She's learning. She's, she's actually in an, in an altered state. And, and you moms and dads know that, right? When you're in, in that state with a kid, especially at that age, and they're... they're gooey and all that stuff, you're, you're, you're in a reciprocal interaction uh, state that is the foundation of empathy. Okay, so the impulses come in through the eye, they go to the visual cortex, they come up here to the limbic system, then they go up here to the frontal cortex, and the, the whole brain, it's not just one place that empathy resides, it resides all over the brain, and it's a, it's a process. Here's another example. This, this child is learning to, not just with his eyes, but also in this case with his hands and also with his ears and with a sense of touch and everything else, smell. He's learning, his brain is forming a concept of what other humans are like, what the world is like. Now, when you see this, a number of women and the, and the most secure men in the room can feel a tug. Right? You feel the tug. You want to respond to this baby. If that one doesn't get you, maybe this one will. Okay. The, po the point is this, is that our midbrains are also at uh, attached, and we're wired this way as well. We don't just learn this entirely. To respond, and we want to make it, we want to, we want to play with the little thing. You know, we want to, well, you, 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 all this, the mother reads called mother reads. These little babies, you know, all that high-pitched, sing-songy voice, all of that. That's universal, by the way, in every culture in the world plays those kinds of games with their children at this stage of development because the child needs that in order to learn the phonemes, to form words, in order to, to recognize voices and to understand this patterns of speech and to, and to see the, the reciprocity and to, and to see the, the fact that they're active agents. This is the exact opposite of being an orphan or being a kid who has been neglected. Now, what percentage of your caseloads are neglect and fat compared to abuse? Abuse gets all the press. 
what percentage are neglect? I would guess 70%, 75%, 80%. Am I too high? No? Yes? Okay. Yes, the general, the general rule is around 80% in certain parts of the country. I suppose it depends on how, how impoverished the, the uh, geographic area that you're working with is. Here's another example, same thing. Critical. This is what you're looking for. Connectedness, not attachment. Different. Here's the reciprocal play. Peekaboo, peekaboo. The kid is learning object constancy, that the world doesn't go away. See, there's no way that a, a child would know a priori that the world hasn't vanished when it leaves its uh, 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 field of vision. But with this game of peekaboo, which is played around the world, the child's brain learns all these things. Now, I realize as we're thinking about this, but the temptation is to go, okay, this, the brain stuff, you know, he just started talking about structures and all of those kind of things. It can get to be a little scary as you're considering it. But it's perfectly okay. As a matter of fact, most of the time, most of the time it's kind of like this when we talk about brain-related stuff. I realize this is what most of us hear, but that's okay. That's all right. We'll get into, we'll, we'll talk about the implications here in just a second. Oftentimes when we're talking about the brain, though, this is what people hear. Well, the, uh, the cops and the uh, murder who imposes and overclock the murder chooses. There's to be discourse upon a part of our history together, people would slip in the underpinning and so forth, where it shows dark vision and auditory slow perfection. Resulting frictation induces corresponding blip mortalizers, but uh, that all comes out of Cronin's electroperiodic simplification, which you will underline in our professor course. Now, resultory frictation and multicentric convulators superlessly alleviate Dutch immediately level Dutch, making contase and together teeth slip temperance and a reflection in inertia corresponds to Hugo Bavert's supercritically balanced multiparatory equation, E equals 2R. <laughs> e equals 2R, where R is the radius of a home measure of the boundary factor. Now, Pavinini, Pavinini stems a parabolic paracelsian reflector of absurdity over least the home of Isri and hetero effect, so that neglectance of Merman's atmospheric supercontraction causes struck dimension of faction county there. So, don't eat them. I hope that's not what you're hearing so far. For those of you with hearing impairment, and you're out there going, I can't understand a word he's saying. <laughs> it's, but that's the point. That's the point of the whole thing. It's, it's, oftentimes we get into this, and it, like it, it feels way too beyond us. As a matter of fact, in the discussion that we're having, you may already feel like, Oh, okay, great. Just tell me the bottom line, please. Pl please tell me the bottom line. Well, let's see if we can't make this a little bit more understandable. Here's the bottom line. We are hardwired to connect. We are hardwired to connect. Physiologically, neuroanatomically, we are hardwired to be in relationship with each other. As a matter of fact, so much so that we know that unless there is another brain to connect with, particularly in those early years, but you know the, the stuff that, we're, that, uh, that the last video was talking about, that doesn't end in childhood. That doesn't end in childhood. Adults need the same process. Now, I don't want anybody picking me up and holding me on their shoulders. I just don't want to do that. It's not that sort of thing. But it, it's a different sort of engagement and yet the same sort of process is needed. Matter of fact, I, one of those things that I really wonder about is to some degree, how, what is the church's role in creating those kind of opportunities for people? But we'll come back to that. This comes out of the Journal of Pediatrics. I love this statement, and we'll walk through it a little bit, because, and I hope you don't hear it as the John Cleese gobbledygook here. But the self-organization of the developing brain occurs in the context of a relationship with another self, another brain. This relational context can be growth facilitating or growth inhibiting. Much along the lines of what we've just been talking about is that 
the conditions that we create in relationships are going to cause something neuroanatomically to happen. But what it causes can be things that are growth inhibiting or growth enhancing. We can have good impact on people or we can have bad impact on people. And that's not surprising to any of us. But we see it neuroanatomically. And so it imprints into the developing right brain either a resilience against or a vulnerability to later forming psychiatric disorders. The relational process that goes on between child and caregiver, mother or father, both are, both are important. Both are a part of this process. But the relationship that goes on becomes neuroanatomical structures. And we'll talk about how that works here in just a second. But I, I want you to realize it's not just these are bad experiences that you've got to get, off, you've got to get away from. These are, these are bad things that happen to you, but please get beyond them. No, there is, there is a structural part to the process that has to happen. Spiritual change and brain change go together. They support one another. And we have to begin to think about that aspect as we consider the formation and development of people. Now, it's in the gaze or early on. Let me see if we can. To the the social interaction that they get from. Let me go back here just a second and let you get the first part of that. Babies this young are extremely responsive to the emotions and the reactivity and the social interaction that they get from the world around them. This is something that we started studying oh, 30, 40 years ago, when people didn't think that infants could engage in social interaction. In the still face experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. I'm like a girl. Oh. And she gives a greeting to the baby. The baby gives a greeting back to her. Yeah. Yeah. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world, and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this. And then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. Yeah. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, come on. Why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction, they react with negative emotions. They turn away. They feel the stress of it. They actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. Okay. stuff that goes on that we all do with our kids. The bad is when something bad happens but the infant can overcome it. After all, when you stop the still face, the mother and the baby start to play again. The ugly is when you don't give the child any chance to get back to the good. There's no reparation and they're stuck in that really ugly situation. I would like to suggest to you that what's going on in that is profoundly personal between mother and child, but the foundation is being laid for loving God with all our heart, soul, and mind. That that's what's happening at this point. The foundation is being laid for the kind of relationship with God that He desires. 
when we are engaged. But here's the other thing, folks. It doesn't stop at childhood. It doesn't stop at this point. When I have interactions with the people that are in my love arena, intimate, stranger, it doesn't really matter. There is this same sort of process being engaged. And it's the part that we have to take responsibility for as we're thinking about this sort of dynamic at work, the gaze. I find it fascinating to find the gaze to some degree mentioned in Scripture. I love, I'm going through Psalms right now. I'm looking at the times where God invites us to seek His face. Now, I realize I, I'm pushing this, but I think the metaphor is, is close. I think it's close. I'm not suggesting that the psalmist had great knowledge of neuroscience, but, it, but I, I, I don't, I'm not suggesting that. But I think there is something human that connects with this, that, has, that we're talking about the foundations of that. You know, this, but you all know Psalm 27. It starts off with, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I be afraid? It's, a, it's about fear. It's about living in fearful situations. And at the, end of the, at the end of the psalm, toward the end of the psalm, we get this. When you said to me, seek my face, when, God, when you say to me, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, O Lord, I will seek. What's this got to do with fear? It's got everything to do with fear. That security that comes even in the midst of it. I, I love that, that kind of the second section in the psalm where it talks about the fact of being surrounded by people that cause me fear, and it doesn't say God takes me out of that. It just says God stands me up and allows me to look over them, to look to something else beyond the fearful situation. What, do I, what am I looking to? We get to, it's, it's Him, it's His face. It's His face that gets modeled in the facial sort of communication that goes on between mother and child that we've just been looking at and thinking about. Do not, do, not some, do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. That's the opposite of the kind of gaze. Remember the good, bad, and the ugly that they're talking about? I want the good, Lord. I want the good. Don't do that to me because that puts me into the bad. And not only do I feel bad, but not, not only is that bad for me, but I feel bad about myself in those situations. I can't distinguish those things. Don't turn away from me. You have been my help. Do not abandon me, not, nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. Here's, for my mother and father have forsaken me. I've not grown up in a situation where I've learned the kind of security that I need to have with you and that you're inviting me into. But the Lord will take me up. And the Lord will heal my brain. Here's what happens. We get, this, we get this imprinting process that we're talking about. It is literally an imprinting process. When mother gazes at child, when father gazes at child, and as they begin to, to engage one another, there is this nonverbal sort of communicative process that's very emotional, very implicit, it's, it's based on bodily reactions, facial expressions primarily. But as, as they engage this process, something's happening in the brain neuroanatomically. Let me see if I can share what that is. You have two different parts of your autonomic nervous system. You have the, you have the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. You may remember your biology. The parasympathetic and sympathetic are competing systems. One does one, one does the opposite. The sympathetic does what? Do you remember? What does the sympathetic do? It's fight, the fight or flight system. It's the thing that gets us ready for action. It gets the body stimulated, all the functions that get us ready to perform, ready to act. That's the sympathetic system's job. Parasympathetic is the calm down system. It's the relaxation system. And so for me to move away from stimulation, for me to relax, for me to calm down, parasympathetic is what does that. That's what's got to be engaged. Now, Here's my question to you. When a child is born, one of those operates completely maturely, and one of those doesn't. It's not fully online yet. You want to guess which one works and which one isn't there yet? Fight or flight, relaxation. 
It's the fight or flight system that works really, really well. I mean, our children can get upset very easily. They can get stimulated and get overworked. They can go all through all of those processes. But you know the thing they can't do until about, they begin the process of learning to do it about 18 months? They can't calm themselves down. The systems are not neurologically present for a child to soothe themselves prior to about 18 months. It's what we now know. And so here's what happens. Who's the, the parasympathetic system for that child? The caregiver. The surrogate parasympathetic process happens outside and moves inside and gets concretized in the brain. The way the child is soothed becomes not only the way the child soothes him or herself, but it becomes a way of viewing the whole world, the whole interactive process. What's being communicated is not just a way of emotional regulation. It's, be, it's communicating something about the world and how it works and what you can expect and what you can't expect in those moments. Does that make sense? And so what we've got happening here is we've got an imprinting process that produces brain-based working models of what to expect and how to live in a relational world. And it starts right out of the womb. Right out of the womb. And children are hardwired to connect to it, and parents are too. Doesn't mean that we always do it. Doesn't mean, because for those children who are not engaged in this way, Orphanages, other sorts of processes of neglect or abuse, uh, disinterest. For those that are not engaged that way, what gets, what gets uh, put into the brain, what gets developed in the brain is not a resilience against psychiatric disorders, but a facilitation of those kind of disorders. This is the way it works. Now, you all are looking very thoughtful here, and I don't want to stop... Sometimes there are structural impairments that would keep that, that sort of relational process from happening and for children to engage, and that's part, part of our fallenness. It, that, that does happen. It is, there are things that get in the way of this, even for parents who are working industriously and in a very educated way to do that, and that's hard. That is very hard. It's, it's almost a lifetime of learning what we're supposed to learn in our first 18 months. It, it really takes that con continued work with that. Any other thoughts, Sean? And is, and is there something structurally in the brain that causes a tendency to autism? There is nothing, there, there's no site that's connected with it. It's, it's multiple, it's multiple sites that are affected in that process. So it's not just one structure in that way. We'll talk about a structural area that seems to be more connected with this. It doesn't seem to be as connected with it's used differently in autism. It's still there. It can still be very healthy. But it's some of the other connected areas that are problematic in autism. Now, let me take a next step then. These biological and psychological working models are the foundation for the unique ways that we view ourselves and others and God. These are the foundational points. And they are more than just socialized. There is something physiological about this process as well. These models become attachment filters that shape how persons feel about themselves, God, and others. They determine how persons make sense of the relational events from the cradle to the grave. So it's not just children. We're talking adults here. You and I are doing the same thing. And here's the, here's the great hope for me. Because in psychotherapy, when I sit with someone... I'm not just hoping they'll behave better. I'm hoping for brain change. And it's possible in relationship with the person. Because here's the amazing thing about it for me. Well, actually, let me come back to that. Here's, uh, we'll get to this in a minute. Here's the amazing thing. That area of the brain we're going to talk about in just a second remains changeable forever. And it always remains attuned to the relational dynamics that are going on. The orbital frontal cortex that is being formed in these early relationships between mother and child never, con never becomes like concrete. You know, we often hear that the brains don't change. We're now realizing that neurogenesis, 
new growth in the brain is occurring all the time. And this area in particular changes from relationship to relationship. And so isn't it just like God to create us in such a way that we are never pushed into a situation that he cannot heal? We're never, we're never put into a relationship that's so damaging that we cannot, in loving relationship with God and others, heal from those moments. We cannot recover. It's just like him. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, somebody else had a hand up. It fell on. Good. Yes. Yes. No, I, I think you're making a good, and I'm not going to get into it too much except just to say this. It's, it's much easier to catch children in their formation years than to try to change children, adolescents and adults, once a, an initial foundation has occurred. The good news is there's hope. The difficult news in this is that it takes a lot of work. And as a matter of fact, it, what's that? It takes the right person, it takes the right relationship, it takes a lot of these conditions coming together in order to make this, these kind of things happen. Is it possible? Absolutely, absolutely. And yet, it's fraught with a lot of obstacles. A lot of obstacles. And so, your point is well, well made um, in this. Let me talk a little bit about this attachment filter idea and see if we can't make it even a little bit more practical for you. There's a balance uh, when we talk about this attachment, and in balance, we find something about security. You know, this uh, in balance, what we find are people who can be, who who have a balance of of how to be themselves and take care of themselves, and how to be with others and engage that relationship in a healthy way. They can be close and they can be distant. They have the capacity to do both. If there's a there's a balance. There's a flexibility. About, about a secure attachment that comes as we are, in, we are formed in relationship with one another in which we have been taught and our brains have been fashioned in a way that suggests I can be secure. I can rest securely. Now, the problem is, is that you put us under stress, not all of us, all of us. You put us under stress and the temptation is to run for a sense of cover, to run for a... a to run for places that will take care of us. And in attachment, if we have been pushed, if we have not lived in, in relationships that have that kind of secure balance, but we've been in relationships that have, been, have, have taught us that the world, there's not a lot about security that we can count on. There's not a lot about the kind of consistency and predictability and safety that's, that uh, many of us have experienced, but some of them maybe not. We tend to run to manage those situations ourselves. Matter of fact, this is one of the hard things for children is that when they're put in situations with caregivers that are neglecting, abusing, uh, disinterested, they have to figure out a way to do it way too early. And so where do they run? Well, one, as opposed to balance, where they tend to run, I'm sorry, I should have done this first as I was talking about secure attachment. These are some of the qualities that are related research-wise to people who are securely attached in relationships. These are the kind of things that we, that we find. And these are empirically validated sorts of findings. These are not just anecdotal. These are things that are shown over and over again in the research studies. 
But you put us under stress, you put us into difficult, and we have more or less of a tendency to run to the extremes and out of balance. One way of taking care of those situations is to run to independence. And so, in order to take care of myself, if it's an insecure situation, or I feel insecure in the situation, one of the places that I run is to distance from relationships. I get away from people. In the attachment literature, they talk about this as dismissing of attachment. These are people that say, I don't feel safe. I will feel safer if I'm away from you, this other person. I want to get distance because with distance comes security. And that becomes not just socially a process, but that becomes part of the anatomical brain process through these attachment filters that are engaged. This is life lived in protective separation from others. Life lived in protective separation. The other side of it is also very possible. Let's talk, here are some of the qualities of dismissing of attachment that you can read through there. You know any people like this? People who, when you greet them, what you feel is more distance than invitation. They're taking care of themselves. There's actually, neurologically, there's a dampening of the emotional process. There are, there are neurological facets of this dismissing of attachment that suggest that this is more than just a socialized sort of behavioral process. This is a neurological process that's going on for people. The other extreme, you can guess, they run to relationships. I am only safe as long as I've got my safe people around me. I am only secure as long as I've got those people that I'm attached to. And the more the better. If there's one, one comment that I get relationally from pastors, it's, the, it's these extremes. It's the extreme of this safe. It's like, they cling to me. I can't get them away. You know, it's, it's like, I, it's never enough. It's never enough. They drain me. You know, it's kind of, this is one of those things I hear from pastors all along. But this is what attachment literature talks about being preoccupied with attachment. I'm preoccupied with attachment in my insecurity because those are the places where I can, I can, I can control them if I'm up close. I can manage people. I can make those relationships into what they need to be for me if I can stay close to you. I can remind you. I can, I can do those things that will help you be what I need you to be in those moments. That's the preoccupied with attachment. This is the protective connection side. Both up, protective separation, protective connection, both out of balance when separated from the other, the other form. Secure attachment holds these together in balance. Here's what preoccupied with attachment often looks like. The hard part with pastors as you're working with those, these kind of people as, is to realize that this isn't just a choose to be different sort of problem. You know, it's a, it's a brain issue too. There's brain change that has to go on to support that process of being different in this. And so it's a little bit naive to say, I wish they would just choose to be different. Well, it's, I wish they could too. So probably they do as well. There's something else going on here. Something else happening. Here's the area of the brain that we're talking about for the most part. The orbital frontal cortex, it's kind of like if you were to take your fingers and push through your eyeballs and scratch that part of your brain. I don't, I don't suggest you do that. But, it's, but if you were to do that, that's what, you'd be, that's what you'd be scratching. It's this orbital frontal cortex. This is the area of the brain that is most relationally attuned. Matter of fact, it's formed early on, it's the, the large area for formation occurs in those early years of life. Interestingly enough in the brain, it sets at the crossroads between the frontal cortex, which is our reasoning, analysis part of our brain, and the verbal centers. It sets between that and the more embodied emotional process that's associated with our limbic system. It, it's the part where those come together and find balance. So it's that part where 
we believe that the attachment filters that we're talking about are housed in some way. Now, that's way too simplistic. I apologize for that because, again, there are, the brain is so interconnected that that's, that's way too simplistic. But let me just say it in this way. This is that area that seems to be most profoundly connected to these attachment sorts of processes. They happen in relationships. They are ingrained in the relationships that we have, and they're changed in the relationship for good or for bad. I've looked at my children sometime and said, you know, you are literally causing me brain damage <laughs> in this moment. Let me just tell you. They don't appreciate that either. So that's... <laughs> we, but beyond my own family issues. Uh, the... Uh, but the cool thing is, this is the area that remains plastic, remains malleable and changeable from relationship to relationship, with Thelma's caveat in mind here. And yet still, this is the area that we're focusing on when we're thinking about the change. Emotional regulation, the way people regulate their emotion in light of the relationships that they're in, this is the, this is the prime mover. This is the area that we find for this. So, formation, the formation that we talk about, we talk about spiritual formation, and, as we should, being made, in the likeness of, uh, being made in the likeness of Christ. This formation must create, that we must create the conditions for corrective emotional relational experiences, as well as knowledge-based learning if people are to grow into that image. It requires a community as much as it requires learning. Because people, how many times have you said, I know that, but I just keep on doing this? Sounds like Romans 7, doesn't it? You know, I know that I, that's not, I know I shouldn't do that, but there seems to be this process at work in me. Now, again, I know I'm, I'm simplifying something that's much more theologically profound than this, but to some degree, is it possible that the corrective experiences, the, uh, the, the things that they're hoping will change them, are just knowledge-based and not engaging in the community that may actually scare them to death? And how do we, as the church, become a part of that process? If the church is the face of Christ in the world, what does our gaze look like? Is it inviting? Is it disinterested? Is it neglectful? I wonder. I wonder about that. Neuroscientist Louis Casalino at Pepperdine says it this way. Loving relationships help our brains to develop, integrate, and remain flexible. Through love, we regulate each other's brain chemistry. And when our drive to love is thwarted, our mental health is compromised. Sounds a whole lot like where we started in this at least to me, we are made for love and we see it in, enfleshed in us. Now, let me just say uh, one final word and then we're going to stop and we're not going to be able to do the experiential exercise, which, ah, all right. I'll live with disappointment. Um, here's the interesting thing. On the basis of all the things that we've talked about, I want to go back to this idea that we are not just the effectors of change in people, but we are the affected as well. That one of the things that we, we find is that how compelling it is for us to respond, uh, to provide complementary responses to strong interpersonal messages. See, it's kind of like this. We oftentimes like to think, because in our own desire to control and to feel like we're the masters of our own destiny, that... Um, it's kind of like it's kind of like we have we have emotions that kind of may fill us up at times and I'm just responsible for those emotions and we say to people they come into our offices and we talk with them and we have this expectation you take care of your emotions and I'll take care of mine and we'll all be very happy oh that it were so simple See, the reality is, is that, yes, I have my emotions that I've got to be responsible for. And this other person in my congregation has their emotions that they've got to be responsible for. But what we fail to realize is that these two cups are embedded in an emotional world and float 
within those sorts of dynamics. Am I responsible for my emotions? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Being a steward of our emotions, absolutely important. Are the, do I need to expect, maybe create situations where this other person takes responsibility for their emotions? Absolutely, absolutely. But the thing we neglect to realize, the thing we neglect to understand is that these float in an emotional soup that we live in and we're often unaware of. That we are both affected and affectors, <laughs> and it spills out there. Uh, the, uh, what that means, what that means is that we have to recognize as we move from relationship to relationship that we are always impaired. Always. Those moments when I'm in a relationship with you and it's intense and we're having difficulty and I think and I look at that situation and I say, I have the right perspective here. I would say to you that most of the time that's a perspective that protects you because you're trying to manage the emotion that's going on between us, the emotional soup in which we are embedded. When I deal with counselors and I'm training counselors, the hardest thing I've got to get them to realize is when they're sitting in the room with someone is that they are affected by the person and the emotional dynamics just as much as this other person is. They are not above it. They are part of it. And most of the time, early on, some never get beyond this, but most of the time early on, their engagement with the other person is to make the negative emotion of the other person leave the room. Pastors do this all the time. Why do they try to fix things? Because they don't like the emotion that's in the room. I don't want to feel this. I don't want to be in this emotion with you. I don't want to participate with you, even though that's the only place the brain's going to change is when somebody will do that with me. I don't want to be in this. This hurts me. When you have negative emotions, when you're angry and upset or you have all of these intense emotions, I don't want to sit there with you because I'm being affected by that. I'm being affected by those things that are happening. So what's the best way to get that to go away? I fix you. I just fix you. Let me tell you what God says about that. Don't you feel better? Oh, good. The emotion's gone away. That's good. Whew. Now I can rest. That's the problem. That's the problem that we've got to address. If we are wanting to be people that not only are being personally formed so that our brains support the kind of image of God process that we're thinking about, we've also got to think about the other side of that, which is how do I participate with this other person? And brain change with other people means that I've got to walk with them in the negative emotions that pain me too. But then again, that sounds a whole lot like Jesus, doesn't it? And I do that not by telling them where they need to go, although that may be a part of it. But that, without the corrective sorts of experiences of relationally engaging it with them, doesn't create the kind of brain change that we're looking for. All right. That's probably the best place to stop. I just remind you that here's the two disciplines that train us to do that. Communion and contemplation. Quick word about contemplation and then I'll leave it at that. Good, substantial research right now that suggests contemplative sorts of exercises affect an interesting part of our brain. You want to guess which, what area it is? It's the orbital frontal cortex. It's real funny that this individual sort of activity that some people have put aside because it's too self-oriented. Actually, it's changing the area of the brain that makes me better for other people. Isn't that amazing? Very interesting to me. People who engage in contemplative sorts of exercises are better at empathy than those who don't. I suggest to you then, it's, the communion is a no-brainer. We need to be in communion with other people. The contemplative process, though, is something that I think the research is beginning to show lays the foundation for being the kind of loving people that we need to be. Changing us, but also being the persons who participate and create the conditions for brain change in others in a positive way. Let me stop at this point, and, uh, and let me pray for us, and then we can talk while we eat or do those other kinds of things. But... Lord Jesus,
kind, Father. We are grateful for your presence. You have been here all the time, and in our task orientation, we kind of get caught up in the things that are happening, and we, we, we may forget that. But Lord, we want to live lives that are more and more attuned to you in whatever we're doing. We want that mutual regulation process that goes, between, goes on between you and us to be one that spills over into the world. We want to be the kind of people that move redemptively into the lives of others. Father, would you start by growing us up, inviting us into those places where our brain can change to support the very process that you desire in us. And then, moving into the lives of others in a way that is for their good and not just for our comfort or protection. We thank you. Thanks for what you're doing in all of us. Thank you for this community of people. Lord, I'm just grateful to be a part. In Jesus' name, amen.